Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you with another episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. I'm really excited to have with me today, Dr. Denise Renier. She is a licensed clinical psychologist, a certified sexologist, an executive consultant, certified yoga therapist, and psychedelic integrationist. She has specialized training and has worked directly with people in the areas of sexuality, relationships, states of consciousness, psychedelic integration, and intimacy. She holds a master's degree in human sexuality from Widener University and both a master's degree and doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Dr. Denise is certified as a sexologist through the American College of Sexologists. She has studied embodied spiritual practices nationally and internationally through research and experiential learning and has conducted and published research on embodied psychospirituality. Integrating the whole person, Soma and Psyche, is integral in her work, in her approach to the work that she does. All right. Welcome, Denise. (laughs) Thank you. It's so great to be here. Yes. I'm excited to have this conversation with you because it's not something we've really explored on the podcast before. Mm. Um, so first, like always, I like to start off with finding out a little bit more about you and how you came to do the work that you're doing now. Well, I just find it interesting that everybody, almost everybody comes here through sex. And yet it's one of the things that we have a hard time talking about. And, um, being trained as a psychologist, I found out that not many people get trained in human sexuality in particular. So I just, it's something that's pleasurable, it's something that's fun, it's something that people are really curious about. And then it's also something that people have used as a weapon against other people, to control other people, to manipulate other people. So I see um, sex and sexuality as something that has a real light side and a real shadow side. So I just, I grew up Catholic and it was not spoken about at all. It was just spoken about if you wanted to get married and you wanted to um, have children. And outside of that, it wasn't spoken about. However, it was everywhere in the news. It was everywhere all over the place. So I've been curious about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is, I think people don't even understand really what is sex therapy and, or what, what makes it different from like regular therapy? So oftentimes I have colleagues refer to me because they're not comfortable talking with their patients or their clients about sex. And it might be something from somebody has an issue like erectile dysfunction or a vaginismus. Um, And because there's not a specific training in it, a lot of clinicians don't feel comfortable. So people have found specific trainings to do. Like I did a master's in it, but you could do a year long certification program in sex therapy. And the way it's different is that it's mainly focused around sex and relationship. And when I say sex, I don't mean just genitals in genitals. And I just mean something more broad. It could be about relationships. It could be about intimacy. It can be about how you relate to your body how inside of yourself you have an idea of what sex means to you, your idea of how you see yourself as a sexual being, how you express sexualness in the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so much broader, I think, than what, yeah, people even in our definition of sex, what does that entail? And and we're going to talk more about like, and nowadays, how many, even in the identity of gender, right? Like how much more fluid and it's not so binary as it was in the past. Um, and I know that's something that definitely comes up in your work, but I think people also have some confusion around sex and that, does that mean that like my sex therapist is going to touch me or like, what, what is the role that touch itself or more intimate, like engagement physically has in this kind of work? 
I mean, sex therapy, traditional sex therapy, touch is never a part of it. It is talk therapy. It may be somatically based in the sense that I might be sitting with somebody and ask them to kind of focus on their body, focus on their internal self, what's going on in them right at that moment. How are they feeling in their body? However, there's never touch involved. Um, where there is touch involved might be a relationship surrogate. And they used to be called sexual surrogates. And the reason mm -hmm. that they're now called relationship surrogates is because the definition of sex is so much broader than just physical activity. So people go to a relationship surrogate while they're concurrently having therapy with a clinician. So they go to a sexual surrogate, a relationship surrogate, and then they learn things like, how do I date? How do I maintain an erection? And a relationship surrogate might take them through and they might explain to them, this is what it's like to talk to somebody who you're interested in romantically, who you're interested in sexually. And then they take them all the way through, what is it like to go on a date? What is it like to maintain a conversation on a date? What is it like to have a first move physically to kiss? And then they take them through all the way, potentially through a sexual encounter. It may be not always, but possibly. And then the relationship with that relationship surrogate is complete. So in the beginning, it's to be known, this is going to be finished when we're finished our work together. And then because it's concurrently going on with therapy, the person who is, is doing this, they can go back to their therapist, they can talk to them about what's happening, and then the therapist can help them understand what's happening in their mind, in their body, and spiritually, potentially, whatever they're working on. Right. And there's actually, and I didn't know this until, you know, much, much later in my career, because I was one of those therapists who they, they, when I was just, I think, still in grad school is when the licensing board said, you have to take a course in human sexuality, but it was like a weekend workshop. It really was. That's all we got was a weekend workshop. And so I didn't even know there was such a thing, I, I think until then, or even later, possibly later, that there was such a thing as at the time they were called sexual surrogates that could be there. Because I've always thought there's some limitation in what we as talk therapists can do with clients not being in the room with them when these <laughs> challenging situations are occurring, right? We're not going to be like, like dealing with your erectile dysfunction here in the office, like in this kind of more direct way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it was really encouraging to me to know that there are people out there who are actually specially trained. It's not just someone hangs up a shingle and says, I'm a sex or relationship surrogate, right? They have specialized training and they basically are learning techniques and different things to help people reduce their anxiety, um, to overcome whatever, maybe it's like his history of trauma, which I also want to explore, uh, whatever it is that's getting in the way, right, of the person being able to actually enjoy themselves, their partner, their bodies, you know, and, and have the positive benefits. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways that a relationship surrogate can help. And again, working with a clinician, I mean, it's, it's so beneficial for somebody who's seeking help. Um, yeah, I mean, trauma is really, a, it's affecting so many people. Um, it's, I'm hard pressed to say it's, it affects most people in one way or another. Um, and if somebody has specific sexual trauma, whether it's overt or covert, I mean, it shows up in relationship, in sexual relationship in particular. It can show up in all sorts of relationships, but when sex is involved, it gets amped up even more. And it's a great way for people to heal through learning about themselves sexually, learning about themselves relationally. And it's, um, it's a way that people can address it physically with the surrogate and also psychologically with the therapist. Yeah, so, so I wanna come back to the trauma because I think that's gonna go in so many different directions, but tell me more just in general, what kinds of issues, so when you're in your office doing the clinical work and all of that, what kinds of issues do you typically see when people are wanting to see you for sex therapy? I may see somebody for erectile dysfunction. I may see somebody for vaginismus. And that one in particular is, is 
connected to trauma in a way that, just to let you know what it is and let people know what it is, it's when uh, somebody's vaginal canal is so tight that nothing can be penetrated. So there's a lot of pain. There's also a lot of shame that can come up around this. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody feels like, oh, I have to perform and I have to be what my partner wants me to be in one way or another, and my body's not doing what I want it to do. So right. with that in particular, um, I might refer to a surrogate, but I also might refer to a pelvic floor specialist, a physical therapist. Um, there's specific interventions that can go on for vaginismus in particular. Um, graduated dilators, which are pretty much medical dildos, they will use them um, in a very slow and gradual way for people to feel more comfortable being penetrated. And that's, of course, if they want to be penetrated. I mean, many people who maybe they're, they are fine in their lives without being penetrated and they don't really need to address it, but maybe they want to on some other level. Um, I have worked with people who've wanted to be um, address this and be penetrated for spiritual reasons. Someone who wants to address it for psychological reasons, like, am I okay if I'm not penetrated? And then they might go to a physical therapist um, specializing in pelvic floor, and then they might um, be penetrated once or in a number of sessions, and then that's it. Maybe they go forward and they engage in pleasurable sexual activity with penetration, and then maybe they don't. It's up to them. Mm -hmm. um, I might also see somebody who has a history of childhood sexual assault or incest, um, and that can manifest in sexual relationships in all sorts of ways, from avoidance to dependency, um, shame is so pervasive when it comes to trauma in general, but also specifically with sexual encounters with people. And then they can't find themselves living a pleasurable time in their relationships, or they may even find a block come up when they're trying to find a relationship or be in one. So there's all sorts of ways that trauma can be addressed and all sorts of issues that people come to me for. I think a lot of people, I'm sure you see this as well. I see a lot of people in my practice as well as at the drug and alcohol rehab where I work, where there's this, I would say, dismissing or minimization of trauma and its impacts. Like, oh, well, you know, sure. I got molested one time when I was a little kid, but come on, you know, whatever, get over it. That's it's not that big a deal. It didn't really, you know, real, real trauma is, you know, being raped multiple times or whatever. And I think people, just, there's just a lot of misperceptions around like even vicarious traumatization. The trauma didn't have to happen to you. It could have happened to someone else and you witnessed it like sexual violence or even seeing on TV or watching porn and that might be more violent in nature, how that can impact folks and be traumatic. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I mean, no one really knows who trauma is going to affect in one way or another. Um, I mean, studies show that early childhood support or lack of support can really show if it's going to show up as PTSD in one's life, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and sexually, that can show up, like I said, in many, many ways, relationally, sexually. And where intimacy is involved, it's so incredibly vulnerable. People will connect with other people and then they have a, a really tough time being vulnerable and letting them see who they really are. And then if that happens, they may be connecting on a physical level. They may be having sex. They may be engaging in what they think they should be doing physically, but maybe mentally they're not there. So maybe there's not their whole person involved in their experience but they're just doing something performatively. So they're not really in it, but they're doing what they should do, quote unquote. Right. All right. To the point of like faking an orgasm, for example, right? Yes. yes. And exactly. you'd be surprised. There are people across the gender continuum, men, women, and everything in between who fake orgasms. It's not just women. So I've yeah. seen all sorts of things. 
Yeah, there's two things I kind of want to explore from that. And, and one is, you know, just, uh, yes, against all the, all the fluidity we're, we're seeing nowadays in this area, but also um, when people have had, I think people, again, don't quite understand how this is this whole person idea that body and mind are not these two separate things. And yet in these moments of intimacy, so many people are not fully present. They're checked out physically other you've got the people who also are checked out physically you know they might be going through the motions but they're not actually allowing themselves to feel pleasure or they're so in a rush because it's so goal oriented you know you've written about this it's so goal oriented we got to get to the orgasm you know that's like the thing we're trying to get through that there's not even time to kind of enjoy the lead up build up towards that um people and people are like so worried about oh my god he's gonna think i'm fat or or god she's gonna think my you know member is too small or I don't know, whatever. People are so caught up mentally that they're not fully engaged emotionally or or physically. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we can even just talk about outside of sexuality and sex. A lot of people, most people walking through the world are not connected to their body as they're in this world. I mean, we're so conditioned from an early age to be in our heads. You know, you got to get through school. You have to do these standardized things to make sure that you make the grade. I mean, there's so much pressure on people to just be disconnected. I have sat with so many people who say they're in um, the high tech world. They have literally said, I have no reason to be connected to my body. I am valued and I am given raises when I am more mental. And I mean, it's a, it's a, pretty persuasive argument as to why not be connected to one's body. However, mm -hmm. I mean, when someone is not connected to their body, they miss all of their own cues. And especially with trauma, people get dissociated, they're not connected to their body. They don't know things like when enough is enough. When that might be, you know, say eating, I don't know when I'm full, or even sexually, I don't know when I'm satisfied. And being satisfied sexually doesn't necessarily equal, I've just had an orgasm. You know, people who I work with who have erectile dysfunction, um, they might feel like they've let their partner down. They might feel like, oh, I'm not making the grade in terms of what I'm supposed to do. I have a penis. It should be hard when I'm having sex. I mean, that's not always the case. And if that happens and I'm... and when I'm working with someone and they explain to me and I just tell them, you know, there are so many other things to do sexually that do not have to involve a hard penis. I mean, there's so many things that people forget about in the world of sexology. We call it outer course. So it's just everything mm. that's not intercourse. And then all of the, you know, all of these kind of phrases and whatnot, some of them are really heterosexually oriented. So we also have to remember, like we can learn so much from the LGBTQIA community that it doesn't have to be penis in vagina for pleasure. Yeah. It's so much more right. than that. Yeah. Well, and I think you certainly do, and I do as well living in California. You know, we, we tend to see a lot more what I would call non-traditional um, maybe we, in the past, we would have called them alternative lifestyles or even sexual fetishes, you know, BDSM and kink and all of that. Um, just more variety in terms of sexual and relationship experiences. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that and how that has, how does that show up in your work? Yeah. I mean, I, I work with people around, um, it's called creative relationship design. It's people who <clears throat> they might want to open their relationship. They might want to open their marriage. They love each other and they know that they're partners, but they want to explore sexually with other people. <clears throat> or they might want to explore romantically with other people. So they might want to have an intimate relationship with someone else and it may or may not involve physical sexuality with someone else outside of the relationship. I mean, our Judeo-Christian setup with relationships doesn't really have a lot of room for that. So people don't know how to do it. 
I mean, there's so many things to work through. There's jealousy closely connected to that, insecurity closely connected to that. You know, am I going to be left because you want to be with somebody else? So the things to talk about when somebody wants to open up their relationship or they want to engage in something that's not just closed and monogamous are infinite. And to have somebody talk to them about it is is invaluable. It's invaluable for them. I mean, to for them to have a conversation that's kind and for them to have a conversation that's respectful of the other person is tremendously valuable. And that may just be opening the relationship. It may be fairly, I know that it this whole concept might not sound vanilla, but in the grand scheme, it might be pretty vanilla. I want to be with somebody else, but I love you so much, and I also want to be with you. Now, there might be some other spicy things that are involved, like fetishes or something along these lines. Um, the In terms of fetishes and BDSM, there is a lot of communication that needs to happen. Even if you're just opening the relationship, and you're not, there's not a fetish or BDSM uh, element involved. So if you are, are having um, fetish, BDSM, the amount of communication to make sure that there's consent is extremely important. If people don't know what they're consenting to, if people don't know what they're getting into, um, it could easily go into abuse unconsciously. People have so many unconscious behaviors that may be played out in this realm that having a lot of conversation up front, this is what I want, this is what I would like you to do, this is what I want you to hear that I want. All of those things are really, really important to the point of talk about it until you feel like, oh my gosh, we've talked about this too much because there are so yeah. many different elements and so many ways that it could go right but also so many ways it could go wrong. Yeah, I've seen a lot of it going wrong. I've, I've learned a lot from my clients. You know, again, having had limited kind of training in graduate school, my clients have taught me really. Um, and how important it is to have rules of engagement. Like these are the parameters. Like, you know, uh, some people, when they if they open up a relationship, they want to know everything that their partner is doing and other people don't want to know anything about it. Um, I mean, so many things like um, who can we play with and in what way? And is it us together? Is it separate? Is it, da, da, da? I mean, just to have, I was amazed at how many layers of intricacies there are, you know, with this and how it kind of all needs to be like discussed ahead of time because otherwise it doesn't work. Other times what I've seen a lot is like one person's really gung ho on doing this and the other person is kind of going along because they care but they're not really okay with it and so how can we help them to get okay with it or say no set a boundary and say no but it's so important to have those rules of engagement and i know books have been written i know you probably help people to set those guidelines but oftentimes what i've seen in my office is people sort of blindly going into it and then it's not having had those discussions and it makes a big mess and now we're not in a good place and I have to help clean up that mess, you know, so. Yes, exactly. There are a lot of messes that can happen. And in the world of sexology, uh, they like to call it agreements rather than rules, because then rules make people start feeling anxious, like I'm going to do something wrong. And so I have people actually write them out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're going to work together creating a contract, this is the agreement that I'm entering into with you in this new phase of our relationship. So then they can sit there and they can have a conversation of, okay, this is your boundary and then I can decide if I agree with it or not. And I mean, mm -hmm. it may take multiple, multiple sessions for them to come up with what are the actual agreements. And to mm -hmm. open up one's relationship, that may take it could take anywhere from a week to a year to two years, depending on the level of patience and consideration and thoroughness that people are interested in and willing to do for the relationship. Yeah. 
And that there are communities and resources for all of this too. Like you don't have to do it all on your own sort of blindly. Like many people have led the way, whether it's a trained professional like yourself, whether there are, um, there's organizations, right? There's all kinds of resources and we can add some in, you know, to the um, show notes as well. Mm -hmm. Any, any kind of resources you think might be helpful for someone who might be interested, but has no idea where to get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the, um, kind of beginner's guide would be The Ethical Slut. And that's a book by someone who's in the Bay Area, Dossie Easton. And she really just outlines what um, what can go on when people want to be more open, but also want to be ethical about it. Because there are many, many people who are unethical about themselves engaging in sluthood. And yeah. there's all sorts of people that you know, have cheated. I mean, it's, it's cheating if you're not doing it ethically. And it's not right. so much about sex. It's not so much about, um, you know, the relationship. It's more about this is, this is a, a cheating environment. And now we're getting into lies and manipulation. And what is this person signing up for if they are in relationship with someone else? And that's something else that comes up oftentimes if people if I'm working, say, with an individual and they are talking about, oh, I want to open up my relationship, but my partner doesn't want to. So I'm probably just going to go ahead and do it anyway. Or I've already done it mm -hmm. already. So then mm -hmm. we get into, you know, people's value systems and what do they want to create in this world and from what, mm -hmm. what foundation. So there's all sorts of ways people can go about opening their relationship, having a different design. And I've also worked with people who they may come in as a couple. I'm working with them. They want to open it up. And then we get into that conversation. And then they, they find that, you know what? Actually, I'm not sure that we do want to. We just had something in our relationship that was lacking or something that we hadn't talked about. And then if they have a space, like in therapy, then they can actually talk about that thing that was missing or that thing that has been unspoken for so long. Right. And, and just think, reminding me too, and people in long-term relationships, how much um, their sexual relationship can change over time, you know, especially if children are involved, right? That's a sort of a notorious, um, you know, the stereotype is it kind of kills the sexual relationship sometimes between the parents because there's no time. Yes. <laughs> or they're too tired, right? <laughs> you know, because the, ch the children are now the center of their attention. And um or the dynamics change, you know, like a sort of like a Madonna whore thing starts happening where oftentimes like one partner, all of a sudden the other, you know, let's say a woman has given birth and now they're seen as like this Madonna type that like, oh, I couldn't be sexual with her. She's the mother of my children or something. And then you see all kinds of interesting dynamic shifts. And then you hear about these partners, you know, like I have people coming in for couples therapy, like we haven't had sex in months, years, whatever, but they're not talking about it. So, you know, we've emphasized a lot of the sexual part, but we also really need to look at the intimacy, the communication, people expressing their needs and wants and how little of that actually happens in our culture mm -hmm. oftentimes. Yeah. And also, I mean, if somebody is in a long-term relationship, the person that they met in the beginning, say one year, three years, five years, 20 years down the line, it's not the same person. I mean, you know, to some extent, we all have challenges or a certain relationship with change. However, I mean, we are changing every single day. And depending on the level of inner work you're doing, you might be changing more than you even realize. And then you look at the partner and then one day it's like, you're not the person that I married. Well, I should hope not because much time has gone on. And now you get to see, you know, who is this person now? And then right. you get to ask the question, do I want to be with them? How do I like this? Yeah. And people often cling to, you know, I have to make something work. I mean, I don't have a lot of judgments around sexuality, relationships. Um, oftentimes, if people need to end the relationship, that's okay too. And that can also be something that can be done with respect, with kindness. And if you're working with somebody, say in therapy, 
then that can be something that people can do as well. Ending their relationship mm -hmm. and doing that in a conscious way. Because so many right. times people do conscious things. Conscious and properly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, I would imagine in your job, you're doing a lot of education um, because there's so much, because again, sex doesn't get talked about. There's still so many urban legends that we hear from the time we're kids about all kinds of things. Getting uh, pregnant, getting STIs, how sex is supposed to be. You know, I had a woman come to me once, you know, so distraught that she wasn't achieving simultaneous orgasm with her partner every time. And what was wrong with her or what was wrong with the relationship that it didn't happen like in the movies every time. And I just had to debunk this myth that like, that's what's, so that's the correct right way to do it. Um, so I want to explore a little bit some of the misnomers and misperceptions that you may encounter in this work. Like, one that came up earlier when you were talking about, um, you know, like exploring kink or BDSM. I think there's a misnomer out there that people who are into that kind of stuff or people who are into pornography or doing filming pornography or even doing sex work or something like that, that, well, they must have been sexually abused. The only reason they're doing something like that is because they're damaged, they're wounded, and they're, you know, enacting it in this kind of way. So that's not, that's not always true, is it? No. No, I mean, people are so complex. They're so multidimensional. It would be hard to say, this is why somebody has this specific kink. I mean, for instance, somebody could trace it back and they could see, why do I have, we'll take like a, a foot fetish, for instance. Many, many years ago, I worked with somebody who he remembered in particular that his teacher would would sit at the front of the room and she would have a high heel that would dangle off and that during that time he was around puberty and he was developing and then that became a sexual object to him now somebody may or may not have a story like that and we don't really know a lot of why some people have fetishes some people have kinks and it's mm -hmm. it doesn't mean oh yeah somebody is damaged because they like x y or z um, mm -hmm. that's more of a, of a model of making people wrong for having sexual proclivities that fall outside of whatever vanilla norm that people are okay with. Um, if people it's have- Jo christian one, typically, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And the, the conditioning that comes with religion, that comes with family, that comes with culture, it's so, it's so blocking people from connecting to who they really are. And when people find themselves in a community, even if it's just connecting with one person that is also saying, I have a fetish or I have this kink, it can be so liberating to somebody. Oh my gosh, I'm not alone. This is not mm -hmm. super wild and not okay. And I'm not gonna be judged or shamed for this. Um, mm -hmm. I had a class in my master's program and it was called Sex in the Internet. And it was around the time where people were connecting with each other around all sorts of things. You know, chat rooms were there, video rooms, uh, people talking about fetishes, and people were reporting because now the internet had come into existence that they were finding themselves decreased suicidality, decreased levels of shame just feeling like they're accepted for all of who they are was a tremendous, tremendous impact on their well-being and mental health. Yeah, that's, yeah. And in some ways it's been a gift, right? A gift and a curse, right? <laughs> in terms of like, there's also a lot of exploitation that's happening on the internet and a lot of kids, you know, getting um, into dangerous situations because of someone they thought was another teenager they met online that turns out to be some grown man who's a pedophile or right mm -hmm. there's all that as yeah. well so like anything it's a double-edged sword but this idea of community so are there like support groups i don't know if support groups is the right term but like or groups of some sort or like um whether online or in person where people who are interested in exploring like different different ways of being sexually in a healthy way, like gather and or can talk and share their experiences? 
For sure. There are so many groups on um, meetup.com, probably anything you can think of. One that I saw recently was um, a sewing circle for people who were in the fairy community. And the and fairies are people who dress up in um, like animal outfits. And it's usually romantic or sexually uh, has a sexual side to it. And sometimes that's just what people like to do. Kind of like a cosplay, sexy cosplay of some sort. Um, so there's something like that. There are, I mean, in the Bay Area, there are all sorts of places that people can go, like Power Exchange Yeah. or BDSM play. Um, yeah, there are They also, had the armor at one point, but I don't know it if it's still did. around. And then I think it closed and maybe it has opened up somewhere. I don't know exactly what's going on at, at the moment with the armory. Um, but there are many places that people can go. And I'm a, a part of this thing called the Bay Area Open Minds. And it's clinicians who are trained and who cater to people who are um, either sex workers or in some sort of alternative sexuality community. Um, so people can find through Bay Area Open Minds, people who work with folks or people who run groups. And it might be a support group or there are just plenty of resources on there anyway, if it's not something psychologically Right. inclined. That's great. We can add a link to that. I think that would be a great resource to share with the audience. Um, and also, I think, too, to look at, um, you know, your role as a consultant, because sometimes you work with somebody like, let's say myself, who doesn't specialize in this, but maybe I have a client who comes to me in private practice or, or a couple you know, that has some of these issues they want to explore more deeply with someone who's trained. So you'll work collaboratively with another therapist or, or professional, right? And tell us, tell us more about how that works. Yeah, I mean, I can't even tell you how many people contact me, like say who I've gone to graduate school with, not my master's program, but the doctoral program. Um, and they will just say, you know, I have something going on with a patient or a client and I don't know how to talk about it with them. And it might be something from they don't know how to talk about sexual desire or a decrease in sexual desire or somebody say who wants to open the relationship. The clinician might have some sort of preconceived notion as to what that means or a judgment about it. And they don't have the education around it. So some of the consultation might be around educating about different sexualities, different approaches. And and also in another form of consulting, um, I've done a lot of executive coaching and I would find that people who I would go into their jobs, work with them in their office, they would end up bringing up things about their relationship. Maybe it was about sexuality, maybe not, but they would say, you know what, I don't have a place to talk about this. And inevitably that would come up and they would say, you know, I know that you're an executive coach, but I am, um, but I have no space to talk about this. So people are yearning for this from clinicians who want to be able to talk about it and be available to their clients, to people in the business world that may not seek out therapy or may not even think I want to go in to talk about sexuality explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you're a great resource for that, for anyone like myself who might want to either improve my understanding and ability to work with those folks or to have you work with them in conjunction with the work I might be doing with them. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I work with people who are already in longer term therapy with someone else. And Mm then I might see them for like a time limited fashion, like five, 10 sessions or three months, something longer if needed. Um, And then that will be specifically around what's going on sexually or relationally while the the therapy that they've been in already is already going on. And that continues and remains. And then I would consult with the clinician who's the primary clinician about what's happening. And then it nine times out of 10, their um, therapy work that they're doing with their primary clinician just really s- skyrockets. And it's just beautiful mm-hmm. to watch. Because Yeah. I mean, And oh go ahead. I mean, sexuality, again, it's not just 
about one what one does in the bedroom. I mean, it's about all of life. And I mean, if I had my way, I would have everybody who becomes a psychologist, who becomes a master's level clinician, be well trained in, in human sexuality. I mean, it's such a part of life. And yet it's too often, like you've you know said and written about, it's not even discussed. We don't even ask our clients about their sexual identity or preferences or practices. We don't know if, I mean, they could be keeping secrets from us about things they're engaging in because they don't feel safe to open up about it or they feel mm -hmm. like they might be judged or uh, any number of different things. So I think it really behooves us as, as treatment, healing arts professionals, even broader than just those of us with like master's and doctoral degrees, anybody, you know, and I think that extends out to the medical world as well, right? Because again, we have this fragmented healthcare system where it's like, oh, I have something wrong with my penis. I go to the doctor and he gives me a pill to fix it. But nowhere in there does the doctor, you know, usually say, well, maybe you should talk to a therapist about some of the other psychological aspects of this erectile dysfunction or premature, you know, whatever it is, something's <laughs> wonky, you know, like maybe there's another reason why this is going on besides, you know, you could take this pill that's always our, our answer here in this Western medical paradigm. Take a pill and that'll make it go yep. away, but it's so much more complex than that. Yes, it's so much more complex. Um, I was telling you a little earlier about, I have this meditation that I help people go through specifically around erectile dysfunction. It can also be for premature ejaculation. And it's just allowing people to come into contact with their body, with their penis in particular, and then also connecting it to their heart, connecting to their mind, and just helping them to align all of themselves. Um, it's not something that people talk about or think about. They think, let me go get that pill, and that's just going to take care of it. And on the outside, exactly. it might take care of it. And then they could do the thing that they wanted to do. But then festering underneath, there may be many things that, that go unchecked. Yeah, all the way down to attachment issues, which we didn't even talk about. It's like a whole nother conversation. Right. But, um, but in terms of that, so that's something people can find on your website. You have other offerings as well. Like I was, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about your sexuality mapping program. That's something very specific you offer folks. Yeah. Um, about say 15, maybe even 20 years ago now, I developed this thing called sexuality mapping. And it helps people go through their entire life of where have I been sexually? How did I, how did my early experiences in life dictate what's happening now? And how does it influence who I am now? And oftentimes people don't think about, well, what happened early in life? They might just think about something explicitly sexual, like the first time I masturbated or something like that. But they don't think about something like somebody walked in on me when I was changing and it felt very vulnerable and I didn't feel safe. And something could happen very quickly, but they might have just overlooked it in their mind when they're thinking about their past and reflecting on it. So this technique allows people to look at their past, look at their patterning and how it influences what they're doing today. And I developed it in a way where they can use logic left brain, and then they can also use creativity and right brain. So I have different ways in which they can get in contact with what it was that has happened in their lives. And then I take them through, um, if I'm working with somebody and they're already in my practice, we might do it folded in. But I also, if I'm working with somebody outside of that, I've developed a three month program for them to specifically just do this mapping technique in particular. And then that way they can use that information um, and they can talk about it with their therapist, or it can just be a standalone program that they go through on their own. Amazing. So if people want to find out more about that or your work or to get in touch with you, where do they go? They can go to my website at wholepersonintegration.com. And then they can find out all sorts of information about therapy, about sex therapy, about um, coaching, anything that I'm doing, any offerings that I have, any programs, this meditation that I talked about is in my shop. People can find all the resources there, and then they can also reach out to me through the website if they have further questions. 
Yeah, and you really offer, again, as an educator, you really have put a lot of information out there in the form of articles on different websites, including your own, where people can just learn more about all this and have it be normalized for them so they don't, right, they're not walking around with all this shame and, and self-doubt, thinking what's wrong with me that, you know, I'm not normal sexually in some kind of way. I think, I think that's a big part of like why we're even having this conversation is to debunk a lot of those myths as well. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and it's very needed right now. Mm. Yeah. And I write, I try to write two blogs a week and they are just offered for free on my site. Um, I want to make, you know, material that I consider just to be basic education accessible for people um, because there is a lot of information that is either not right, incorrect, or people just don't know about it. So I write from anything um, from working, I have an article for clinicians working with sex workers to erectile dysfunction and how that can be seen through a holistic lens um, through, I have an article on this sexuality mapping, all sorts of things. Also um, doing the psychedelic assisted therapy, I have a lot of overlap with sexuality and psychedelic assisted therapy and integration as well. Yeah, we might need to have you come back at some point to talk about that work because that's also <laughs> super fascinating and surprisingly there's some parallels um you yeah. know that you draw in that article so uh, people should check in the meanwhile people <laughs> should check that out so thank you so much denise for being on the show today do you want do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with i would just say the people can be the most that they can be themselves and that's my hope for them that they can be the most them yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And thank you all for tuning in today. If you like this podcast, please do comment, like, rate it, whatever platform you're on, so that uh, more people can get this information, uh, share it if you'd like. Uh, but we really want to try to get this information out in the world so that more people can see how many different myriad of possibilities there are when it comes to mental health. I'm Dr. Adriana Popescu. See you next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.